Members, we now move on to questions for the Minister for Communities, and I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly to ask the first question. Thank Mrs. you, Principal Kelly. Deputy Speaker. Question one, Minister. Uh, thank you. Pray you last can call you. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And with your permission, I'm going to group questions one and ten. I will publish a consultation outcome report on the fundamental review of social housing allocations next week. This includes a primary or preliminary uh, time frame for implementation of the proposals. I have publicly stated that I will not proceed with the removal of intimidation points. Um, I want to retain these points for those who really need them. I know there is a strong perception that intimidation points were abused. I want to see alternative mechanisms implemented to strengthen, and strengthen the verification process and indeed to put an end to this abuse. This may require the establishment of an independent body once options have been developed. I personally think it is unacceptable that victims of domestic violence are not treated with the same priority as those who currently receive intimidation points, and I want this to change as soon as possible. Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, in, in my constituency, many people have points of 130 plus, such as the housing shortage and crisis amongst many families. You will be well aware of that, I'm sure, in your own constituency, none of which have intimidation points. But can I welcome in your answer uh, the particular regard that you want to pay to victims of domestic violence? And how do you think uh, that you might put um, a process or framework around that will ensure that domestic violence victims are not uh, um, disadvantaged in any way by any review? Thank the member for her question. Indeed, her supplementary, and as she rightly knows, in my constituency, some people are sitting on 240 points without intimidation, with no prospect of going anywhere. Um, but in relation to um, victims of domestic violence, I think there was a broad assumption that people who, you know, were sub subject to such abuse and violence were uh, getting alloc an allocation of uh, intimidation points, and this wasn't the case. It did come up in the consultation. It didn't come up as strongly as I felt it would, but it certainly came up since once people realised that that wasn't the case. So as soon as I publish the consultation report next week, I'll be moving straight into options with officials and hopefully have something in the coming months. But it is really important that this has changed. Ms. Linda Dillon. My question has actually been answered in what the Minister has just outlined because I, I was well aware that domestic abuse points unfortunately were not included in intimidation points. And I think you've just given the time frame, but just to clarify when we might expect the, the, these points to be in place because it has been an outstanding issue, certainly in my constituency, for a long time. Thank the member for her uh, question. Um, as a member will be aware, as part of the um, recent statement I made here regarding the overall tr housing transformation, and the case of the fundamental review was um, certainly highlighted. Um, that whole statement will have uh, uh, certainly needs to be changed within the changes in the statement need to be made within this mandate. But there are pieces of work within that, that I am currently progressing along with others. So I would hope within coming months that we'll have a completely different system in terms of the allocation of points, which will include intimidation points for those who have been victim to domestic abuse and violence. Mr Stuart Dixon. Speaker, thank you, Minister. Uh, indeed, thank you very much for, for indicating your strong priority for, for victims of domestic violence uh, in the future. But would you agree with me that there were disgraceful scenes in this House earlier today when the Chair of the uh, Justice Committee attempted to derail important uh, domestic violence legislation, and that will, uh, in fact, exacerbate the situation that you find yourself in? Um, well, taking the member's last point first, I didn't see it. So I'll, I'll look at it, um, but certainly um, I think the start of his uh, question was really in relation to why people have waited so long. Um, and I think just going from his and other people's um, responses and reactions, we'll agree that this is quite appropriate, that these intimidation points are kept for people who have been subject to domestic abuse and violence. Ms. Michelle McElvey. Thank the member for her question. Um, my department's COVID-19 recovery revitalisation programme 
has already allocated £17.6 million to councils to enable them to create a safer environment for shoppers, visitors and workers. And this has included contributions of £5 million and £2 million from the Department for Infrastructure and the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, respectively. The programme was designed to be as flexible as possible to ensure that each council would deliver a plan which addressed the specific needs in the area. And indeed, every council plan has included a small grant scheme to help businesses to provide more COVID-secure environment for their customers. The eligibility criteria and value of these grants was determined by each council in consultation with local stakeholders. The total value of these grants across councils, all councils, is currently approximately six point nine million. Ms. McElveen. Um, for the response to that question. Um, the previous tranche of funds, um, which was distributed to Ards and North Downborough Council, which covers the majority of, of my constituency, was available only to those businesses within the designated town centre, and that was at the suggestion of her department, leaving many dozens of businesses without the benefit of assistance. In fact, there were 22 in one street in Cumber alone. Um, is the minister going to do anything to provide assistance to those businesses who, by virtue of a line in a ma on a map, were unable to avail of that funding? Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I mean, the member will be aware, even from her previous role, um, that I'm responsible for uh, town lands and villages with a population of 5,000 over. Um, both myself and Edmund Poots, who I also want to wish um, the very best, um, done this, uh, this scheme jointly to ensure that no one was left out. So I'd find out what happened, and I'd certainly write to the member, and hopefully. Um, Whatever did happen, in terms of whatever gaps there are, they're certainly closed, but I'll certainly get the detail and, and I'll actually talk to the member personally. Mr. Pat Catney. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, I was wondering if uh, you could uh, provide a breakdown of the number of businesses uh, that have this money has already reached and uh, examples of and by council area, if possible. Well, I don't have that detailed hand, um, but certainly I'll write to the member. But certainly, I know some of the when I was talking to some of the businesses about how they were hoping to avail of this. They were looking at additional sanitation. They were looking at infrastructure around safe social distancing. Some of them were looking at outside heaters, street furniture, awnings, um, gazebos, um, and things like that in order to try and help bring customers in in a, in a safe way. But I again uh, have. I don't have the details to hand at the award each council got, but I'll certainly get a from the member. Commissioner Ennis. Yet, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, we know that there's been a delay with some of uh, the financial support schemes established recently. Uh, can the minister set out the steps that she has taken to ensure councils receive these allocations quickly? Well, I thank the member for her question. Um, I mean, that's why I'm a bit, it's a bit surprised to hear. The, um, cons the concerns that Michelle McElveen has raised, because the onus on both myself, Evan Poots, and indeed Nicola Mullen, was to ensure that these schemes, unlike others, got out as quickly as possible through our councils, um, who indeed have been funded by this department, to ensure that they are given frontline services as quickly as possible. Um, so, unlike other schemes, the councils, to be fair to them, have acted very, very quickly. We have made the application as simple and as straightforward as possible while respecting and honouring due diligence and ensuring that each council, council was as flexible to the needs of their local businesses as possible. Um, so, again, um, as each tranche has rolled out, we have ensured that speed has been off the essence, and I hope and look forward to ensuring that that is the case right across the board. Ms. Karen Mullen. Uh, Thank the member for her question. So my department has a number of supports in place which include the automatic one off COVID nineteen heating payment of two hundred pounds. Um, and for people who are in receipt of pension credit or the highest rates of disability benefits, ten pound Christmas bonus to people in receipt of a qualifying benefit, winter fuel payment of one hundred to three hundred pounds for older people, a cold weather payment of twenty five pounds, universal credit allowance has also increased. I've increased the annual income threshold for discretionary support 
have instructed the self-isolation grant for people diagnosed with COVID. The provision of food remains a priority for me, and I provided an additional almost £800,000 to Fair Share a Food Redistribution Charity, and indeed £750,000 to councils to have access to food. My department has also allocated a further £3.5 million um, for access to food, and I hope to make announcements in the not too distant future about our warm, well and connected policies throughout December and indeed January. Ms Mullen. I thank the Minister for her answer so far and for her work and ongoing support to those most vulnerable and also for meeting with the community and voluntary sector along with myself um, and Darian Strabane last week. Can I ask the Minister to outline her intention to work collectively with all our departments and agencies to ensure long-term and targeted support is provided to those most in need? Um, I thank the member for her question. And indeed, it was a pleasure to meet uh, both herself and Martina Anderson, indeed the many workers from the FOIL constituency from right across the community. Um, I think it is important just to put it on record, even just in response to the last question. Both myself, Edmund Poots, and Nicola Mullen are working on the revitalisation fund for councils. Both myself, Naomi Long, and Robin Swan are working around supporting people, and indeed, particularly around homelessness. And indeed, from an executive's point of view, you know, every allocation that I have received, I have enjoyed the full support of each executive minister in relation to the substantial money going into sports and arts. But it is important that we do uh, use public money to get better outcomes for people. So just to reassure the member and indeed other members that I will continue to take that approach. Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, can the Minister confirm if a household can receive multiple heating payments if there are more than one eligible individuals living at that address? Um, well, it's just one household, so the COVID heating payment is a one-off. That's on top of the winter fuel payment, um, which is anything from £100 to £300, and it's a household who's the applicant. So. Um, this is in addition to what was already there, um, and particularly, as I'm sure the member will agree, um, given the fact that people have had to isolate a lot longer, and what we thought we would in March, and we're going into a really, really cold spell, it's really important that people not only stay warm, but to stay safe and to stay well. Mr Roy Beggs. Can the Minister advise where individuals who are in receipt of a supplementary payment due to their complete loss of their award when transitioning from DLA to PIP are entitled to this additional heating payment? Well, the, the criteria is for anybody who is on pension credits or higher rates of disability, higher rates of PIP, including the childcare or the children as well. So if they are currently in receipt of that, never mind what they are transferring to, they will meet the criteria and should receive it. If the member has examples where he feels that may not be the case. He can just drop it up to my office. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, Minister, you'll recall um, this time last year, approximately myself, yourself, and Christopher met with the. Uh, sorry, question number four. It's too close to Christmas, Paula. Anyway. Yes, I do recall that a draft framework and policy proposals for the legislation on sign language was consulted on prior to the publication of the new decade new approach, which committed us all to introducing a sign language bill. It is my hope to introduce a sign language bill very soon in this mandate, and my officials are engaging with the Office of Legislative Council with a view to establishing a timetable and preparing instructions. Ms. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, as you re re recall from that evening we spent in the, the um, church hall in my constituency, um, how important the sign language bill and language will be. And I'm sure you will have heard from many constituents about the loneliness they have felt during this um, lockdown. I'm just wondering, to what degree will you be reading across, not just in terms of access to public services, but access to wider societal um, issues like sport and community life? Well, the member will, will be aware that even um, in certainly the, the, the last year when I was in DECAL, I brought forward the framework, and that framework was widely consulted upon, um, and it did touch across different sectors, um, and it was with the help um, of the sign language framework that we will inform 
the bill come forward? Or has this has been widely consulted upon? If anything we've heard from the sector is just to get on with it. Corley, Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, can you advise if lessons will be learnt from um, what was done in the south of Ireland and in Scotland as well? And can you uh, commit to meeting with uh, the, the sector in terms of implementation of, of this? Um, well, uh, well, thank you. And I know that um, all other jurisdictions and legislators have been consulted upon and any bills or acts or pieces of work that they brought forward not only helped shape the framework but will help shape the bill. And I met, um, I met with uh, people who are, who are deaf or partially deaf not so long ago and I have made a point of um, meeting as many people from that sector, including parents who have children who have lost their hearing or don't have hearing. Um, so I am more than happy to, to meet more people, particularly given the fact that I mean, this is not put on a statutory footing, and there is a denial of rights here, particularly for families, uh, because this is this is how they communicate through sign language, and we definitely need the legislation to enable that. Mr. George Robinson. Mr. Principal, Principal Deputy, uh, question five, please. Thank the member for his question. When I can find it. So, for a payment to be made in a public liability claim, there must be some degree of negligence established. So, therefore, depending on the circumstances and given rise to a water leak, and in some cases it may attach to the housing executive, or in other cases it has been attached to the contractor, it is also possible that there could be an establishment of joint responsibility against both the housing executive and the contractor. Tenants are advised. Um, to have uh, contents insurance in place, but this is not always affordable. The Housing Executive provides a useful guidance and information on public liability claims on its website. Um, and I would welcome any comment from anyone if you take the opportunity to have a look at that. Thank you. Mr Robinson, thank the Minister <clears throat> for her answer. But will she undertake to ensure that clear, clear guidance is issued to tenants, as at present there is confusion and frustration at no clear pathway for Northern Ireland executive tenants? Well, I'll certainly have another look at it. Um, and if it needs clear, well, you're telling me it needs cleared up, so we'd need to have a look at it. Um, and then I'll certainly write to the chief executive and the chair of the board thereafter. Any guidance on any department's website needs to be, you know, as cle clear and as plain as possible so people can get access to information and hopefully the services that they need. So uh, I would certainly do that. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much. I thank, thank the Minister. I, I wonder if she could inform the House, either today or in writing, of the average amount paid out in recent years um, because of damage, uh, which is the responsibility of contractors. Well, I um, will have to do that in writing. Um, because I don't have, I don't have that um, information. Um, I also know that, for example, when there has been, uh, you know, a, certainly a contest of who, who has the responsibility, it has become protracted, and unfortunately, the tenants are always sit in the middle. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a satisfactory position to be in. But I'd certainly get that information and write to the member. I call Ms. Liz Kimmins. Very well, good brief, Ms. and I thank the minister for answers so far. Can the Minister um, advise, are public liability claims against the Housing Executive a frequent occurrence? Well, I know um, certainly for anyone who is subject to water damages and leaks, particularly if a contractor has been in, uh, once is enough. But again, like to the, the member for Strangford, Mr Mike Nesbitt, I will get the, the member um, a breakdown of what has happened even in the years. 19 to 20, um, and indeed, I'll share it with Mr. Robinson, who asked the primary question about, first of all, where the, the housing executive was responsible, where the contractor was responsible, and what the outcome was, if any. Mr. Patsy McLeod. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Principal Deputy Chief Executive. Well, we have Slation out of Foster. Um, could I ask the Minister just the, the importance of updating tenants of their responsibilities in regard to proper? Recovery for contents on the lakes because we're coming into real cold weather. We've had a wee sample of it, and you don't want people being left literally wet 
and caught with no cover at all, and their house possibly ruined through flood or other or other circumstances that have occurred through the poor weather in their home. The member probably heard at the start of my um, answer to Mr. Robinson. I mean, it is about affordability. For many families who are on low income and are living in poverty, a decision to either pay for house insurance or feed their kids is often what they're dealing with. It is um, the responsibility that it's in the tenant handbook. It's constantly reminded to tenants by the Housing Association and indeed the Housing Executive. But equally, you know, when you're talking about families who are living in poverty, housing insurance isn't really in the top of their list. Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you. Question six, please. I thank the member for her question. Um, my department has a range of initiatives to support people facing financial hardship over the Christmas period. So, as I, I give to um, Karen Mullen, just a breakdown. So, you're talking about the winter fuel payment. You're also talking about the cold weather payment. If um, there's prolonged cold spells, you're also talking about a Christmas bonus of ten pound. You're talking about an increase in discretionary support. Um, you're also talking about access to food and other supports um, that my department has funded the council, and indeed, hopefully, very, very soon, will be announcing additional supports as well. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the minister for answering a note or earlier answer to you. I'm thinking of partic particularly of food banks at this stage and those who use them, because in East Belfast we have Mana and the Larder, um, both run by churches, both doing sterling work. Um, but regrettably providing a vital service. But the Minister will know that as more people struggle, there's more in need, more people uh, desperate and fewer people able to give, and the food banks are running short. Is there anything her department can do directly with food banks, or can she advise how food banks can tie in with Fair Share? Well, certainly both. I mean, Fair Share have received money from my department, um, and most of the community food banks, if not them all, are working very closely with Fair Share. And even in our own constituency, I know through some of the allocations from Belfast City Council, and even from my department through the have been monies gone through, I'm currently looking at additional supports. I just want to put it in record that I mean, like ideally, there shouldn't be food banks. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, there shouldn't be food banks. We need to have more money in people's pockets so they can make their own choices. But while, while we are in this situation, um, I'm sure the member will agree that right across the executive through my department, there has been substantial support for bids for me to help people with food support um, and indeed uh, other essential items. Well, Ms. Cara Hunter. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, can I ask the Minister if so someone should need to claim universal credit in the month of December, will her department be taking any steps in order to ensure people receive a universal credit payment, which can usually take up to six weeks, so that nobody will be left penniless at Christmas? Thank you. Absolutely. And the contingency fund is there. I mean, people shouldn't be waiting five weeks for their UC payment. They shouldn't be offered loans either. So the contingency fund is there, and there's also the discretionary support as well. So people can get a payment, which is, you know, no one should be sitting like that over Christmas. Um, and I just want to remind people why it is in legislation around universal credit, credit that you have to, you, you will wait a few weeks. People shouldn't be offered a loan first. They should be offered money from the contingency fund. And if that doesn't suit money from the discretionary fund. Mr. Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for answering. On the back of Ms. Hunter's question, um, a vital uh, support mechanism, as you've picked out, is the discretionary support. However, I'm aware that applications are taking upwards of seven days at present in some incidents. Uh, can the Minister advise what steps she will take to reduce the time taken to process uh, applications this side of Christmas? I'm sorry to hear that, um, genuinely, because I was keeping I am. I certainly was keeping a close eye to the um, average payment, and it worked out about four days. And still felt, you know, we could try and get a payment out as quickly as we can. Uh, but just to give the member assurance, the staff there have been increased, the training has been increased. Um, the staff are completely committed and dedicated to ensuring that no one is left, either without food or without money, particularly in these very, very cold days and in the run-up to Christmas. Ms. Emma Rogan. 
My yogurt has canned kolia. Um, I would like to thank the Minister um, so far. Minister, what is your department doing to ensure that people are aware of the benefits that they are entitled to and to take up that help that is available to them? Certainly, I know Advice and I will give them a plug, but certainly Advice and I have been very good at publicising um, benefit take-up campaigns, but certainly publicising what's available. I also know that anyone involved in the independent advice sector will be letting people know, as have um, the AGNI and many, NICFA and many, many others. The difficulty is you'll always find people who don't have access to social media, and if they're not connected to those groups, we do publish information. Um, and in, indeed, if there are instances where there's groups uh, or individuals you know, who found out about something after the fact, if the member or anybody else has that information, come back to me, because we want to close these gaps. We don't want anybody left sitting destitute or without. Dr. Kiva Archibald. So I thank the member for a question and I'm pleased to advise that we will be providing increased funding to help remove barriers to work for people receiving income related benefits. So for example in Scotland the Job Start Scheme payment is a grant of 250 or 400 if the recipient is the main carer for a child or children. This is only available to those aged 16 to 24. Um, here, the, ad the Advisor Discretionary Fund can currently provide up to £300 to remove a barrier to work, and I'm increasing that limit to £1,500 in a 12-month period and expanding the range of support so that it can be used for. Dr. Archibald. Um, I thank the Minister for her response and um, that, that's useful information. Can the Minister um, provide any assurances in relation to the participation in Job Start programmes? I'm not sure. Is a member asking about sanctions? Because this isn't about sanctions. This is about a voluntary programme where you know people, you know, young people aged 18 to 24 will hopefully you know avail off. Um, and if they can't, rather than don't want to avail of it, they won't be sanctioned, which was the problem, particularly for young people um, with uh, educational challenges and certainly those with mental health issues and leaving care or being looked after. They were in the bracket of young people who were more sanctioned than others. It was about can't making their appointment rather than just didn't bother turning up. Mr. Robin Newton. Deputy Speaker, question number eight, Minister. Sorry about this. You're flying through these. Sorry about this. Sorry. So our local charity sector is vital to us as a community, especially now. I know that charities have been struggling financially because fundraising is down. In June this year, I put £15.5 million into the charity fund, and I'm pleased to say 501 successful applicants received a total of just under £9 million, 8.8. I'm aware, acutely aware that charities are still facing significant, significant financial challenges. And I'm working shortly. I'm working on uh, announcements shortly for a further phase of funding to support them. Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will know that um, although the numbers she quoted there have been supported, that quite a number have not been supported. And it seems to be that there are those charities who are, because they operate uh, in a national basis. Um, even though they are independent in Northern Ireland, but because the reserves of the national body, then the local body is perceived to be ruled out of getting funding from the Department for Communities. Can I ask the Minister if she would look at the situation where local bodies tied into national bodies are eligible for funding within the support that she has on offer? Um, I'm quite sorry to hear that, uh, because any charity that has reserves does not exclude them from plan to this fund. And again, if the member has any examples, I'd be happy to receive those. Um, I mean, this is about how people try to raise money here for the charitable pur purposes here to provide good outcomes for people. Uh, the whole charity uh, fundraising has been greatly 
inhibited almost to the point where it has ceased. So I would be really disappointed, particularly given the work that people are doing on our behalf, if they didn't get any support at all. Thank you. We now move on to topical questions. And the first member on my list is Mr David Hilditch. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can I uh, seek some clarity around grassroots sport? I know there's been uh, a lot of talk and communications in relation to the elite sports, and they have got back on the road again, albeit with barriers in place. What is the situation, and can you clarify for grassroots, particularly of the younger side of things? Well, thank the member for his question, and I know his interest, um, certainly in grassroots sports. I'm hopefully getting a bit more detail on that today or early tomorrow. I mean, the, the number of spectators has increased from where it was, but I, I think the member's asking when can the training in that commence? Um, and we're, I'm still waiting on those regulations to be sorted out. I would hope to be sorted out as soon as possible, um, because I know that a lot of sporting bodies, but particularly the smaller clubs, have been excellent in terms of social distancing and providing sanitation um, for some of the youngsters and to try to keep them as safe as possible. Mr. Hildish. Thank you. I appreciate the, the Minister's answer. And I'm sure she will appreciate that kids are now developing from around five, six years of age through the early teens before they go into those sort of older age groups. It's that sort of very young element. And they've lost out so much this year. I'm just seeking the Minister's support that that will be looked into as quick as possible and clarity so that. Well, I'll, what I'll do is, um, I mean, the chair of the Communities Committee is here, and when those regulations are brought forward and further clarification and guidance is offered, it will be copied to the Committee, but I'm sure it's copied to yourself as well. Mr. Roy Beggs. Retailing forms an important element of our town centres. But all, whether multinational or local independents, are struggling with the online shift. Um, but they still form an important social and community space. So, my question to the Minister uh, what action have you taken in terms of contacting the Finance Minister to get a reduction in the long term level of rates that are charged so that more realistic rents are charged and that more businesses will be able to survive and provide a service to the community? Well, I haven't had a conversation with the, the finance minister about long-term trajectory of rates. Uh, we're more focused on, first of all, there has been rates uh, reliefs. There certainly has been his support and indeed all the executive colleagues' support, including your own colleague, for the revitalisation fund, getting money out to help particularly small and local businesses. Um, but I'm happy to uh, copy the answer to Conor Murphy of your question. Mr. Beggs. I thank the, the, the Minister for her response, but, but there is considerable pressure which will be ongoing beyond our COVID period, and that's why I'm, I'm asking the question. And similarly, um, has the Minister, or in conjunction with the Finance Minister, made contact with the Chancellor so that our online large retailers such as Amazon pay fair taxation and are in, unable to continue to shift their profits offshore uh, and use complex tax avoidance methods? Leaving local retailers at a disadvantage. Well, I, I wouldn't norm. I wouldn't ever contact the British Chancellor because it normally happens protocol as opposed to the Finance Minister. I've absolutely no doubt that in relation to supporting our local businesses, uh, that has been raised. I mean, the issue of big global companies coming here and paying very little tax has been one that's been with us a long time, and I agree with the member. I don't think they pay their fair share. In fact, there's been court battles, which are probably still ongoing around some of those big names. Uh, they're not paying their fair share either. Their employees are, but as companies, they aren't, and that's not right. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I know the Minister has been uh, very vocal and very supportive of all levels of sporting groups, and uh, I know the Minister will also share my fear that some of the, the groups, whether they're grassroots amateur or elite, uh, are coming under viability pressures at this time. Could the Minister give us an update on the Sports Hardship Fund and any other work that her um, department has undertaken? Well, I thank the member for his question, and indeed I share his concern around the impact indeed, that David Hildage has raised. Um, I think that this year has been horrendous for many people, and you know, particularly young people have lost out in quite a lot in terms of socialisation and their friends. And no, no better example of that when they're with their their friends um, when they're playing sport. 
In terms of sports hardship, um, I'm sure the member will be aware that I have paid significant money forward, and indeed, there's £25 million going into sport. I met with the governing bodies and the Northern Ireland Sports Forum last week, uh, along with Sport NI. We want this process to be as straightforward as possible. The applications are open. Hopefully, awards will be made at the end of January, beginning of February, to help people not just about their loss, but the impact of COVID. But the best thing that we can do is get these, this guidance sorted as quickly as possible so people can get back to doing what they want. Mr. Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Give you a proper title this time. And thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I've had a, a number of uh, emails and le uh, written letters from constituents concerned about the viability of Belfast Giants at the SSA Arena, uh, a, a great success for, for Northern Ireland and one of the sports that truly unites us here. Um, can the Minister outline if she has uh, had any contact with Belfast Giants or if she is aware of any uh, assistance that has been sought? And would she then, if that was the case, consider any application that was made? Um, well, certainly, you know, like many others, I was, or maybe not like you, but I was shocked to find that the Belfast Giants are here 20 years. It's just let you in in, in the blink of an eye. I won't personally receive any applications, so it will be Sport and I. I'm aware that they've made an application or will make an application because I've seen them covered in the news, a local news bulletin, not mention their name in case you're giving them an unfair advantage. Um, but again, that's, that's been something that many of the groups are talking about because they obviously they need some support. But certainly, um, the, the Belfast Giants are more than aware of the application process. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I just want to follow on from uh, my, the previous uh, speaker and welcome the Sports Sustainability Fund, which opened on Friday. Just want to ask the rationale behind um, all of those groups and organisations and clubs having to go through their governing bodies. I can see how that might benefit those larger organisations, such as football, GA, and rugby. But for some of those smaller um, groups and uh, clubs, their affiliated bodies may be in other parts of the UK or Republic of Ireland and slightly more difficult. So just the rationale behind that. Well, just to give the member assurance that the governing bodies aren't making decisions on their applications, they're supporting them. Um, and the Sports Forum uh, deals with a lot of the other governing bodies, the smaller ones, and indeed Sport and I usually deal with some of the elite athletes and others. Um, it's also to help them with the template, particularly the smaller groups. So like, for example, a small five-a-side football team should not have to go through the same due diligence as Linfield. That's not fair, but the IFI should be there helping them, and indeed anybody else. So that, that was the rationale behind that. Ms Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I then, on the same vein, ask as well um, what conversations she's had with the Finance, finance Minister? I was recently made um, aware of a cricket club that had applied to the Finance Minister through the Finance Minister for that stream of funding, but was told that they had to apply through this sports fund. So it's just asking you, um, will there be an even playing field, whether it's a working man's club, a social club or a sports club, that they'll not be disproportionately affected applying through the sports instead of the, the Department of Finance funding? Well, the, the primary function is about sport. So a working man's club that doesn't have any attachment to sport other than its name need not apply. Because, you know, so, I mean, but you, you, would be, you wouldn't be surprised at some of the queries I've had. Um, there, in my opinion, this needs to be as straightforward as possible because people have had a tough enough year. So if anybody's in any doubt, you should go to Sport NI and ask for support with the guidance. Um, if they're not getting it from a governing body, or if they do get it and it's not enough, maybe need more detail, go straight to Sport NI because they are primed and ready to take any queries. I mean, I got that assurance last week because that's one of the things that I asked. Mr. Matthew Tull. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister specifically in relation to arts funding and the, the different funds that have been announced? Of the £29 million that was uh, allocated, can you, could you just update us on exactly how much has been um, allocated and how, may, how much in terms of grants have been made? Well, I, the, I don't have all that uh, information on hand, but I'd certainly write to the, to the member, but I just want to assure him. Um, that we will and have made uh, additional funding available for individuals, freelancers as well, um, because the, the, they're, they're going through an awful difficult time. They don't receive public money normally. Um, but as for the rest, the breakdown of it, um, 
and I'm not saying this to be smart, it is, the Arts Council have published it on their website, um, but certainly I'll, I'll get a breakdown of grant given under each heading, um, and I would suggest it goes to the website as well. Mr O'Toole. Thank you uh, to the Minister f for that answer. Can she give us some assurance that um, all of the allocation will be got out to artists, creatives, whether they're technical. I've dealt with a lot of constituents who are, you know, someone, for example, who, who runs stage crew. It's a wide range of people who've been completely excluded from other schemes and they're a vital part of our creative industries. Is she confident that all that money will be got out before the end of the financial year and that people who need help will get it because some of these schemes aren't opening until the new year? Well, I, I want to assure the member, because I've heard you know, speculation, not only just about when the sports fund will be available, but when the rest of, or any of the arts fund will be available. The Arts Council have got this out to people as quickly as possible. Um, individuals in particular, some of which the feedback I've got, have said that they've been helped at the right time with the appropriate amount of money. Um, so I just want to give assurance to the member, indeed to everybody else, that it's been as open and transparent as possible and it's been supported and made easy by the staff of the Arts Council as well. Ms Gemma Dolan. Prelas Concordia. Minister, in your statement on the 3rd of November, you said that you want to establish a statutory body to oversee the verification of intimidation and you wanted to see the PSNI more involved in the intimidation points system process. Can you give some more detail on how the proposals will be progressed? Well, I thank the member for her question, and that, that was one of the first questions that both Dolores Kelly and Linda Dillon raised at this question time today. I mean, first of all, we need to have a scheme that's robust and it's verified properly because intimidation points have been abused by some. And when people abuse the system, those people who are lying on sofas, four generations under one roof, indeed. You know, some of us are sitting with constituents with over 200 points who haven't received intimidation but are sitting with that. They need support. It. We need to ensure that the system is robust and it does verify anyone's claim for intimidation points. Ms Dolan. Gourmet Ogut and uh, Minister, thank you for that answer. Um, clearly, it will take time to develop new proposals. Will interim arrangements be put in place during this development phase? It will take time to develop the proposals and I, next week, will announce the fundamental review into the allocation of points, the consultation into that. Um, I will be meeting the Housing Executive along with my officials to look at next steps. I want the proposals brought forward as soon as possible, um, particularly for those who are victim to domestic abuse and violence, to ensure that they aren't further penalised as a result of the current system. This is Martina Anderson. Uh, Minister, what support has been put in place for councils like Derry and, St and Straban for loss of income in 2020-2021? Well, I've, um, I think I'm counting up to well over 85 million at this stage, um, and we're still we're still going. Uh, it's money that, first of all, is needed. It will keep the councils open. It will keep the essential functions going. But you know, the member will see in her own constituency. Um, the council have, provide, have been the, the funding conduit to get money out around food, around essential support for the community. Um, so the executive has completely supported that. I've met with Solace, I've met with Nilga. They are putting in more bids, I've no doubt, but this department has fully funded each of those requests. Gomez, well, Minister, for that answer. Um, what has been the department's decision-making model that it's put in place for the income support? allocations for each council? Well, the, the model has been that, in fairness, at the first, when the first application went in, when Deirdre Hargit was here, there was a very, very strong due diligence done to ensure that whatever asks the council were putting in, they were tested by our own financial mechanisms and procedures, and they withstood that due diligence. Um, the requests are coming in based on what the council needs. And to be fair, that relationship has been respectful. It has been inclusive and it has worked. I think all of the 11 councils, the money that they put in for in my department, have received their full amount. Mr Gary Middleton, one question and one answer. Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I recently um, qu uh, sent a question to the Minister around the sub-regional state area fund. Uh, can the Minister give an indicative time frame as to when that would be expected uh, to go out? Well, the short answer is as soon as I get the final business cases, um, but I have to say the 
my officials, Sport NI, the IFA, are all working very, very closely. Um, I would hope that an announcement would be made regarding sub regional in spring, early summer. Thank you. That concludes questions to the Minister for Communities. A point of order, Mr. Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, I would appreciate the Speaker's office to investigate the Alliance Party member for East Antrim, Stuart Dixon, who, at uh, question one to the Communities Minister, uh, made very serious allegations and maligned my character uh, whenever he said.